We welcome you all to the launch of our first Let's Talk About Florida book discussion. We're coming to you live from the History Center. I'm Pat Eagles, the founder of the Boca Grande Historical Society, co-founder, and serving today as your moderator. We have 18 speaker participants and very many listeners. Our Zoom format is easy to follow. Our program producers, Sean and Brooks Paxton, as well as our tech expert, Vic Redman, are on standby to assist if needed. I think we're all ready. Patrick Smith was our first author presenter that the society invited to speak in 1995, the year of our founding. The audience reception was so great that we invited him to return a few years later. I had the pleasure of spending a good deal of time with him on his visits. He was a house guest at the Van Italy's, our co-founders, and our evenings were filled with stories, music, and laughter. My memories run deep and somewhat parallel with Patrick's. He was a Mississippian, as was my mother and her family. Oxford was home to Patrick as he graduated Ole Miss and also received his MA there and eventually would teach creative writing. I was accepted to Ole Miss in 62. Patrick's new job in public relations began that very same year, and it required him to escort James Meredith safely to his classes. As you may recall, Meredith became the first African American to enroll at Ole Miss. This experience caused Patrick to write the book, The Beginning. My aunt and uncle's home on Jackson Avenue adjoined that campus, and I was to stay in their old Southern style home while attending class. Patrick said he often saw William Faulkner walking across campus as Faulkner was on faculty too. I like to remember my grandmother was courted by William's younger brother, John, a prominent attorney in Oxford. Special memory that I shared with Patrick. When I opened Patrick's book, A Land Remembered, it awakens a child within me. And I can't wait to start reading and ride that open prairie with the McIvy clan. We get a bit of this feeling today when visiting Payne's Prairie near Micanopy in central Florida. This sweeping saga spans 110 years, covering three generations. No one had ever written such a story. The author said he could have easily written a history of pioneer life in Florida, but he desired to write with emotion and great detail of the people, their personal stories. There you see skillet, topography, and geography. He describes in detail the hurricanes, the killer frost, the mosquitoes. It really captures your imagination as he takes us on this exquisite journey through place and time. Patrick spent two years researching the state and two and a half years writing the story. He wrote three books before A Land Remembered. Forever Island is about a Seminole's village life in the Everglades. And he spent a year or two working on that particular book. And then came Angel City, about life in a migrant labor camp. CBS produced a film based on Angel City, and Patrick had a minor role as an okra seller at a farmer's market in the film. You can see him right there. I love that picture. So Patrick spent a great deal of time in Florida researching these books, decided to move here permanently in 1966. Patrick's wife, Iris, had deep family history in Florida, so some of the characters bear resemblance to her ancestors. Patrick was nominated seven times for a Pulitzer Prize, five times for the Nobel Peace Prize for Literature. In 99, he was inducted into the Florida Artist Hall of Fame. Patrick died in 2014 at 87 years old on Merritt Island, where he and his wife lived for many years. His son, Rick, was a presenter for Boca Grande Historical Society a few years back. Merritt Island is near Cocoa Beach in the Space Coast. A few years after Patrick died, 
a group of Florida educators decided to edit his book into two volumes for their students. It is and has been required reading in all Florida elementary schools. Now we'll take a minute and talk a little bit about the elements of Southern writing style and how it's so deeply embedded in this story. You know, the dialect writing is not often used in other writings because it's viewed as condescending to the race or ethnicity being portrayed. It's popular in Southern writing and it incorporates local speech and patterns such as ain't and y'all and the misspelling of words to display meaning such as ya and summers. Took me a while to figure summers out and you notice that was mentioned several times in the book well, I'll ask you later what you think it means. <laughs> so there are many examples of Southern books and dialect writing. We'll talk about those when we get into our open discussion. But an example and a land remembered are the main characters' names, all taken from Old Testament. You have Tobias, which is gift from God. Zech, Zechariah, Hebrew translated, the Lord has remembered. Solomon. Hebrew translation for peace, and even the horse, Ishmael, translated, God listens. So you notice lots of colorful characters involved in Southern storytelling, culture and tradition woven in. The characters are realistic. Southern writers have a sense of background and a unique way of life worth writing about. Chivalry and Christian values are extremely strong elements. Now, Karen, would you like to start with a summary of the book? Sure. I'm just, I'm actually just going to add a few piece, additional pieces of information to what Pat's told you. Um, a Land Remembered covers, as Pat said, 110 years of McIvey family history in Florida. When the McIveys arrived in 15, excuse me, 1858, real Florida had about 140,000 people. Georgia, the state they had left, had more than a million. So the Florida they came to was very sparsely populated. Now by 1968, when the book ends, Florida had almost 6.8 million people or 50 times growth in 100 years. By the way, in 2020, it's estimated that we are 22 million people. Perhaps this growth is part of the reason many of us read A Land Remembered. Since Florida may not be where we were born or schooled, this book is our history textbook. And we aren't the only ones who use it that way, as Pat has already mentioned. Many of Florida's elementary and junior high schools use this in their Florida history courses. Now that brings us to our first question. What in the Land Remembers story of Florida surprised you? And I'm going to pick on Pam Heilman to give us an answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, lots of surprises. I think like most of you, I was certainly, I am certainly not a native Floridian. I often refer to myself as a beginner Floridian. And my concept of Florida growing up in the North uh, were things like uh, sunshine and oranges, uh, water skiing at Cypress Gardens, alligators, maybe some palm trees but nothing like the pioneer experience that is portrayed in the book. And it's just so wonderful. And the feeling that you have that you're just immersed in the land. And so it's almost as though every chapter is a surprise. Who knew Florida was a major cattle state? Now, at one point, I gather, there were more cattle in Florida than Texas. No longer true, of course, but a definite part of our heritage. And although somewhere in the back of my mind, I think I knew, you know, the Spanish connection, 
uh, just the way the cattle are sold to Cuba. And of course, being here on Boca Grande, we hear how the mullet were at first sold to Cuba before um, refrigeration and the train and so forth. So this really strong connection to the Spanish culture in this part of the world was also quite new. Uh, and I'm sure many of you had, have had much the same reaction. Witty, any, any thoughts on, on surprises? Witty? Yeah, there she is. Here, I had to un unmute myself. Um, I just was fascinated by the generation, the generation to generation evolution, and what happened to this family when the third generation um, took charge. And it reminded me a little bit of what often happens in family businesses mm. that you start up the founding generation, then it's the next generation, and then the third generation or the fourth lose sight of the original intent or the original values. And so Saul quickly, he got into the commercial side of uh, life in Florida. So, so I found that very, very interesting. Anyone else have something they'd like to contribute? On the surprise end, I guess, raise your hand if you do. Well, I wow. thought there were many surprises, so <laughs> I'm surprised that we don't have more answers from our group. Don't be shy. I have, I have, a, I have an answer. Come oh, on. Robert. This is Robert. Yeah, I was surprised. Hi, everybody. I was, I was surprised at how kind that Tobias was with the Native Americans. But oh. now that you mentioned Patrick Smith's experience with James Meredith, I can understand and it resonates more clearly with me how he was so inclusive. Patrick Smith was so inclusive of the Native Americans in his writing. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is David. I I just want to say that so much of this book is familiar to me. I mean, my even when I was a kid, we would run through the pine forests of Central Florida and heck, just off island in Placida, for that matter. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, my great grandfather used to run a livery service uh, from Punta Gorda to. Fort Myers, crossing the Alva Bridge. It was, uh, he had a mule and a cart. This is about 1880. And he also owned a mercantile in downtown Punta Gorda and sold Turtle Bay oysters. And uh, so, you know, a lot of this is very familiar to me. And then some of the other things that I've read in the past about how, uh, for example, the, I think that, some of the early people on Boca Grande walked there from um, Cortez, Florida, which is off of Bradenton. Mm -hmm. And they literally walked down the shoreline uh, to Boca Grande or Gasparilla Island. And I think it was some of the, uh, who was it on Gasp the Gasparilla fishery? The, uh, who was that? that the Albritts. Yeah. I think some of them. And also some of those boat builders up around Cortez. Anyway, I, I was just, you know, as I, I was reading along this, and it, so much of it reminds me of some of the things that uh, um, was written in Killing Mr. Watson. Mm -hmm. You know, about the area around Fort Myers and Punta Rasa and what a bunch of criminals were really down there. Oh, yeah. Including Jacob Summerlin. <laughs> oh. Anyway. That's my take on it. Well, you notice Summerlin is, or the name Summerlin is mentioned in the book. Yeah, yeah. Along with a couple of other names that we're quite familiar with around here. You know, Hendry is another one. So there are, a there are a number of families that we know the names of in Boca Grande who came to Florida about the same time. I think the Knight family 
arrived in Florida about 1840. And there is actually a little town kind of northwest of Plant City. I haven't been there, but I've looked at it on the map called Knights, Florida. Knights, Florida. Never heard of it. You never heard of it. I don't think it could be more than You know what it probably was, was uh, there were, I have friends that live on Anna Maria Island who grew up around Wachula, who said that as the mine, the phosphate mining got closer to their town, they just dug the town up and the <laughs> town went out of existence. And they it used to be so remote, they had their own money called Babbitt. You oh. can still find knights on a MapQuest search now, huh. but then that family moved further down into what they called Manatee County, which included Venice. So that's how big Manatee County was. Yeah. And then ultimately, I think the Knights had had a um, like a store and a boat place and all of this um, on the Peace River and at you know Charlotte Harbor area. Yeah, yeah. The so, little town of Charlotte Harbor. Yeah. Yeah. That's where my people had a homestead. My great, my other great grandfather. Uh, Sam Roberts uh, homesteaded a piece of land. It's on Charlotte Harbor. Unfortunately, the house burned down, but uh, 1872, he homesteaded there on the little town of Charlotte Harbor and he raised pineapples. Hmm. Yeah. Well, what else do people, did they read and said, wow, I didn't know that? Oh, yeah. Oh, come on. Somebody must have. Yeah, the, the intensity of the the intensity of the mosquito attack and the malaria and the malaria and the the wave of mosquitoes. Wow, what a powerful, <laughs> beautiful writing about the mosquitoes! I had no idea it was that intense. Yeah, they were killers. <laughs> really terrible. And what the mosquitoes hey, Darcy, can, can we go back to the, what were you surprised about? Because yeah. there was something that really surprised me was how almost violently Saul turned a different direction from his family. Mm -hmm. and, and I kept trying to figure out, was it simply because they had all died and his father had told him not to get close to anybody that, like a dog, you would lose them and mourn forever. I, I was just shocked at, I, I really, the, the violent turn of his personality from that of his father and mother and grandparents. Mm -hmm. I think, do you think, it, do you think it's indicative of, of the change that happened as Florida developed? Well, see, I feel like he was the symbol in terms of personality and person of what was happening to Florida. You know, he evolved into a more uh, aggressive businessman, let's develop everything kind of person as others were doing similar things. He just sort of led the way. But I agree with Gay. It was, uh, that was a real yeah. turn of personality. It was a definite departure from the McIvy clan, their way of thinking. When he, when he left the clearing, when he left the hammock, he, he decided, I am going to be different. Yeah. And I, I just, I could never grasp what the motivation was, that, you know, what, what drove him to be so different, to be, frankly, disrespectful of the environment and of the Native peoples. Money is the answer to that question. <laughs> okay. Well, that does seem so what do you think? How do you think Florida was developed? I mean, look at all these people that even live on Boca Grande, um, starting with the Babcocks, the Wilsons, whomever. These were old line Florida families. Then, instead of orange groves, it becomes condominiums. And the, and the return is so much greater. And so many people, you know, kind of sold out Florida, really. Tore out mangroves. And we only have half the mangroves that we had in Florida in 1960. Only half. So that, I think greed probably played a lot in it. And I that's why you too. see the change in that guy. 
It yeah. also happened to all these old line Florida families. Their descendants looked around and said, there's a lot of money to be made in developing our lands. Anyway. Yeah, Pat, well, I, I, yeah. Um, and I think you, you had started this. I, 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 I had the sense that that's what Patrick was trying to write about. And you're right, in, in the book or for the character, it, you have this feeling of violent shift, but I, I thought it was his way of portraying this extraordinary drive to development that is Florida. And after reading that book, I would say to people, I think development is Florida's middle name. And yeah. it's just, it's, it just keeps coming as, as we know, and we can only hope that more and more of us um, are more concerned about the environment than the dollars, but it so feeds on itself. A state that doesn't have a state income tax to raise the money it needs to do things. So where does the money come for all the local governments? It comes from real estate taxes and development fees, which are huge and totally almost born concept to somebody from Western New York. I mean, for, as I understand it, 40, 50,000 or so a unit in these condominiums that have sprung up in Sarasota. And so this, this huge force of development to me is very much a part of Florida, not necessarily a good one. Mm -hmm. So interestingly, he doesn't portray the character as, as the beautiful man Tobias was. I also believe that as man moves further away from the land and into buildings, man-made buildings, structures, he loses his connection with the sacredness of the land and the real value of it that the early mm -hmm. family members had. They lived on the land, you know, and of course, Tobias died in his field, you know, hoping to save his crop. But, you know, there was that love of the land and a survival uh, feeling that really was incorporated into everything they did. Also, this acceptance of uh, the Blacks into their community, into their family life, the Native American into their family life, uh, because they were surviving and it was all one group of people, one community. There was no differentiation between skin color and culture, if you will, it was survival. And then as man moves you know, more into the city, more into structure and away from the land, I think he loses his memory of how important that is. And really awful things happen, but also Saul was in the middle, this his age and his third generation out puts him into the middle of that awful land grabbing period of time in the 20s, 30s, right? That overtook Florida. Now, quite frankly, it still is, <laughs> as Pam mentioned. But yeah, it was a violent turn. Certainly agree with that. Um, and some people have said they wondered why he began the book with Saul. But I think Saul was filled with regret. I don't know about you all, but that's my take on it. Yeah. What do you think? At the end of his life. I think at the end of his life, he truly was regretful. Yeah. Um, hence his provision for various um, preserves of the land and such. But there was so much he couldn't undo that I think he was not just regretful. I think he was somewhat shameful mm -hmm. in his own behavior. Yeah. Um, I, I, will, I will share a thought with you all. I, I happen to be a cattle producer, and I was really taken by the cattle drives. And moving cattle is a tough thing to do, even when they're domesticated. I cannot imagine moving a wild herd of cattle the way mm -hmm. they did. That was remarkable, just remarkable. And really long distances. 
Uh, exactly. Uh, Florida is the second largest cattle producing state east of the Mississippi River oh, yeah. and has been for, for years. The, the largest cattle producing state, strangely enough, is Hawaii. And, oh, wow. uh, uh, Hawaii also used to uh, swim their cattle off of the big island onto ships, and then they were taken to the other islands and also to Southeast Asia. Swimming cattle is not unique to Florida. You know, I think if the uh, book had started 20 to 30 years earlier than 1855, the relationship between the Floridians who were here at the time, the Caucasian Floridians, was not that good with the Seminoles because, I mean, it was a war, you know, and they sent Andrew Jackson down here and, you know, it's kind of like Vietnam and they just, they just, didn't accomplish anything, and so they went home and declared a victory. But I guess by 1855, things had kind of calmed down a little bit. But most of the Seminoles had gone in the Everglades to hide out, so they weren't up in Micanopy in that area. So that's probably what the issue maybe was. I think a lot of the uh, fighting with uh, Jackson was really even further north, like up in the Panhandle and, and probably further across the state. But I think you're right. I mean, obviously, people, while there are people who came from the south and populated Florida, a lot of people came from Georgia, the Carolinas, Alabama, and it seems to have um, happened mostly after, after the Seminole Wars. Although not entirely, you're right. I mean, there were, there were people, even in Fort Myers at that time, so. I think a lot of the Florida settlers were Southerners who were having problems with the the post-war situation and felt that they could get a new start in Florida. And, and there were a lot of, you know, people that carpetbaggers and whatever you want to call it, a lot of escaped slaves had come to Florida and kind of joined with the Seminoles. So, you know, Florida was kind of a mishmash of people that weren't happy with the, their current situation economically, uh, you know, in the, in North of Florida, and probably most of them were from the South, but I'm not sure about that either. Sounds like today. <laughs> Only the group is older today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, some of the same reasons for sure. Well, and, and you know, the other thing is with a lot of places, not just Florida, uh, you could homestead. I mean, you could get land just for occupying it, which would not have been true in perhaps all of the original uh, 13 states. Um, so people left Pennsylvania and went to Ohio, or they went further west because land was literally free. It was free. That's what brought Tobias here, I think, initially. And then he couldn't understand the fact that Zach wanted to fence and buy land because to him, everything was, was there for, for you to use. It was free, basically. And that's what drew he and his wife and small child here. But it, look you know, how things have changed. We keep talking about how people came from elsewhere up north of Florida to Florida. Some of my people, the Roberts, uh, came from the Bahamas, from Green Turtle Cay, and then made their way into Key West in the... I think it was 1840. And so they settled there. And one of my, uh, my great grandfather, Sam Roberts, who had the homestead in Charlotte Harbor, uh, his father was killed. His father was a caulker in Key West. And it, he was killed uh, when he tripped over a rail as they were launching a ship. He got crushed. And, and he was raised by the lighthouse keeper, who my brother Mark used to tell him, would beat him mercilessly with chains. So at 15, he escaped with you know, a Cuban smack boat and ended up in uh, Cape Sable and then made his way up north to Charlotte Harbor and started fishing off of, uh, I guess, at Pekin's Ranch and then went over to Charlotte Harbor. Anyway, that's an interesting thing that, you know, a lot of people think that everybody came from north. A lot of people came from the south, too, or from the Bahamas mm -hmm. into Florida. That's a good point. Well, what do you think, what are some of your favorite characters from this book? Well, uh, certainly they were well-developed. 
So what do you think about that? Which one stands out to you the most? I don't know. You know, again, they all seem so familiar to me because I, I've been around Florida for so long. I've seen all these characters. Heck, there were a bunch of them on the island. Even like I mentioned, you know, about the Wilson family raising cattle over in central Florida, Coot Wilson. And uh, he was a great friend of my brother's. And Coot was just a regular dude. I mean, you would not know this guy had a pen. And... Uh, so, you know, a lot of the characters in the book, they are familiar to me, like the people like Coot Wilson was, or is. And, you know, Coot walk around cowboy boots and old plaid shirt. I'm telling you, you didn't know the guy had two nickels rubbed together. He's just as nice as he could be. So, I don't know. They're familiar to me. I like, I like it. it. Sorry, I should have raised my hand. Um, I, I, I like the choice of names. I mean, Frog, Skittle, um, Bonzo. Wasn't Bonzo one of the names? Yes. You know, in addition to the <laughs> names that came from the Bible, the contrast with some of the, you know, local characters. And yeah. Frog, Frog was another one of them. I mean, I thought, wow, what a rich array of names. And, uh, <laughs> how they lived up to those names. My grandfather had eight brothers and uh, some of their nicknames were Brick, Pork Chop, Dunk, <laughs> Muddy. They all had nicknames. Shug, Shug Fudge. So yeah, everybody had a nickname. And Shug Fudge, uh, they called him Sugar Boy. And he always wore white when he was a guy. White hat, white shirt, white pants, white shoes. He always had a pell-mell sticking out of his mouth. That's what I remember. Anyway, so, you know, these characters that I see in this book are the same sort that I see on the island or saw when I was a kid. Hello, Dick. I, was anybody else amazed at how, uh, of the longevity of the clothing that people wore? I mean, like Skillet is, you know, he gets his bottom nipped by an alligator, and I think it's another year before he gets another pair of britches. <laughs> <laughs> it was very remarkable to me that they could wear the same thing 24-7 for two or three years, and it didn't just fall off of them. <laughs> <laughs> good point. That is a good point. But I was just yeah, guessing they didn't get to town <laughs> that often. <laughs> and if the store didn't have anything that fit you, he must have been a big man. That's how he's described. It's a big, big I man. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> they didn't have his size or anything close to it. He'd have to wait another year or so. That's funny. No, I, I've heard that. Porter Ro Punter Rossi, where they loaded the cattle out, was used until the 20s or 30s, you know, until the fences got so bad. But uh, And that's what well, I understand is the Likes Brothers got the shipping business when they yeah. need to move their cattle to New Orleans or Havana, and they were getting held up by the shippers, so they just bought their own boat. So. Mm -hmm. Now, Punarasa doesn't exist as it's described in the book today. Obviously, they're not bringing cattle there to put them onto a ship, but onto boats. But what what exactly is Punarasa today? Is it part of another metropolis or what is it? Anybody know? It's well, been it's, eaten it's, up by another community, I think. It's on, it's on the way to uh, Fort Myers Beach and Sanibel. Yeah. And some of it's developed, but a lot of it is not. A lot of it is just mangroves and mangrove islands down there. Mm -hmm. It's at the mouth of the Caloosahatchee. Well, I just thought of Punta Gorda. I mean, I know that's probably not reality, but that little village came to mind every time I heard them talk about going to this port to send out their cattle. Well, they yeah, they sent them out of Punta Gorda as well. Right. Yeah, sure. And that originally was called Whorehouse Point. 
It was Cattle Dock Point. It became Cattle Dock Point later, but it was originally Whorehouse Point because that 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 old building. There was an old building out there that was a house of ill repute. That's where the cowboys had let off steam when they came from Arcadia. But doesn't the name signify that? I'm sorry. The name Punta Gorda. It, isn't that what it means? It means fat point. Oh. I've heard other interpretations of it closer to your description. <laughs> no, well, I'll leave that for another time. Yeah, another okay. time, perhaps. <laughs> All right. I got a great story about that if y'all want to hear it. <laughs> I'm not, you want to hear not about sure. the story about Whorehouse Point and yes. fishermen from Boca Grande? Yes. Go right ahead. Yeah. Direct okay. vote. So Frank Futch, my great grandfather on the Futch side, uh, he and uh, I think he had 25 men on his mullet crew that were operating out of Gasparilla Village. And they had made a huge strike, made a bunch of money. And he took all the men to Whorehouse Point for the weekend to celebrate. Well, it just so happens on Saturday night that the cowboys were driving the cattle from Arcadia to or House Point, Cattle Dot Point. And uh, when they got to the House of Ill Repute, the madam says, I'm sorry, Frank Futch has bought the house for a week for the weekend. And a gun battle ensued. <laughs> and people got shot. And then Frank Futch finally told them they could come in the next day. So that kind of settled things out. Wow. That's a true story. <laughs> believe it. West coast of Florida. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you think today the natural beauty is enough to draw people here both to visit as well as live? There's still so thousands of acres of natural beauty in the flora and fauna. Do you think that that's still a lead reason that people come to Florida? Are you talking to me? Anybody? I think so. I think Florida has some of the prettiest places that you can imagine. Turtle Bay alone, I think, is as pretty as it gets anywhere. Anywhere. Yeah. You would go back in Turtle Bay and sit there for a little while. It's pretty nice. Yeah, so, you know, the fishing. I live in California now, and there's no fishing to speak of here. You still have great fishing in Florida. Oh, yes, we do. Yeah, so people go there to fish, of course. Well, I mean, that's the reason we came here. It was it was the beauty of nature. We didn't know a soul. And we came down to this little island and we just fell in love with its rustic, kind of simple, but rustic beauty and no development to speak of. And, you know, we are actually latecomers. We arrived in the mid 80s. But... Uh, it hasn't changed that much. Of course, there are more development, but I think it's been managed quite well. But for us, it was the the beauty of the nature that brought us here. I, I do agree with you, David. I just don't think there's any place like it in the U.S. Beautiful. I don't think, Pat, that perhaps a more complicated question, because I suspect uh, and I know it was certainly true for myself that I didn't understand uh, the diverse, much less vast, uh, natural beauty of Florida and the things that are here. I mean, the first time you see Payne's Prairie, mm -hmm. um, it's it's so breathtaking, mm -hmm. and to, and to understand that we used to have bison you know, ro roaming that. It's a real a real prairie. And of course, the Everglades are certainly, I guess, more popular spots that people know. But there's just, there's just so much. You, you know, um, Mayaka River State Park, I mean, things mm. that are close, that are just gorgeous. Um, but I'm not sure many people today come for that uh, again, because I'm not sure they they know everything that's uh, here. They they may think beach or whatever, 
but it is so much more than that. And it is beautiful. Even the scrub. Yeah, I think so too. I love looking at the pine and slash the slash <laughs> pine and the palmetto. I think those forests are beautiful. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I have a I, lot. I to, the floor and fauna to me are, are what it's all about. I record all kinds of wild creatures as they cross my path each day. And I was communicating with a group of my friends in Santa Fe where we lived for a long period of time. And this was just a, two months ago. And I sent off the photos because someone was complaining that they had ants. And this is in Santa Fe. They had ants in their closet and you know, they were eating away at a hat box or something like that. And I said, oh, so you think you've got <laughs> strange creatures in your closet? Have a look at this. And I sent off about 15 of my photos from just critters that hang around my house, from scorpions to ghost spiders, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh, you could not believe the comments I got back. Oh, well, that's why we would never live in Florida. That's awful. That's terrible. It's too wild of a place. You know, and I, I just love it for that very reason. It is wild. There's still so many wild elements of it. And I think that's what keeps me here. That's what drew me here. Yeah. Anyone have a comment Gay, about that? I think Gay had something to say a few minutes ago. I had to go let my dog out. <laughs> but you, you raised your hand a few minutes ago, Gay. No. no. She's so okay. muted. I think she's muted, yeah. Wait. There, now go. am I muted? Now you're now I think now you're good. Okay. I can't even read the little things on my screen. I, I think people come to Florida for different reasons, somewhat based on their generation. Mm -hmm. um, my parents started coming to Florida in 1951, and I can tell you it's because they wanted a winter vacation. We lived in Indiana. It was cold up there. Um, my grandparents retired to St. Pete in about 1954, and they spent their winters there. And I, I, I know they went to uh, Wikibakti Springs and, and that kind of thing, but they mostly stayed in St. Pete with people of similar backgrounds. And then you look at people in younger generations now, they're coming to Florida for jobs. Mm. You know, they're because of our aging population, and, and we do have a shortage of uh, people in their 30s and 40s with some skills who are able and willing to work. So, I mean, it, it's a good place to come to for jobs. And I frankly think the flora and fauna and the natural beauty of Florida is um, pretty far down the list of the reasons people are now moving to Florida. I mean, I, I, I say that with a big degree of sadness. Yeah. No, but I think you're right. Yeah. I think so. Again, I, I think, well, people love the weather. We know that for sure. But, you know, there's a lot of fear about hurricanes and our changeable weather patterns, the rising water, you know, all of those environmental issues play a major role too. Um, and, you know, those are the things we don't like to talk about, but they exist here. And it's something that we, have to learn to work with and deal with hopefully in the next years. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about Southern writers. I think that's probably something we all have a personal feeling about. Let's talk about some of your favorite Southern writers, who they might be in the, your favorite Southern book, writers books. Anyone wanna mm -hmm. jump in here? You know, Patrick used this, the elements of Southern writing. I mean, this was just classic, the way he laid out this book and wrote. And um, that's what hit me first, besides it's being a great story. He used almost all of the elements that we talked about in the beginning of this discussion. 
Who were your favorite Southern writers? Pam? Well, I'm, I'm probably not really strong in this area, which is one of the things I've enjoyed maybe learning. And I, I thought your list earlier on the screen was fabulous. But um, one that comes to mind would be, I guess, Marjorie Kennan's Rawlings. Again, the feel of the land, the culture, uh, the dialogue. Um, you just really feel as though you're living with her at Cross Creek and, and floating down uh, the river. Um, and, um, you know, again, somebody we've talked about maybe highlighting in, you know, in one of these conversations in yeah. the future. Well, she certainly used the dialect in her book. Actually, Patrick's dissertation was on Marjorie Kennan Rowling. Mm -hmm. That's probably not a surprise to us, but yeah. And, the and, you know, I think people know her for the yearling, but yeah. um, last year I read Cross Creek. Yeah. And if people haven't read that, I highly recommend it. If you enjoyed Land, A Land Remembered, I think for the same reasons you would... And of course, most of it takes place in the last century. It doesn't go back as um, far, but it really is about the community and and her interaction with a whole variety of uh, local people. As I recall, she wasn't originally from from the Micanopy Cross Creek area either. She moved. Moved from, in, um, so Minnesota um, or something like that. Yeah, and so again, you get her kind of uh, sense of discovering uh, again the land, the people, the culture, the cadence. You feel that in a land remembered too. This being tied to uh, the rhythm of the land, certainly in the earlier with the McIvies. Mm -hmm. and how that really influences um, their life, the pace of their life, the way they move the cattle across. It's difficult as that clearly was. It wasn't as though they just drove them, as you know. You know, they go slowly to eat the grass. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just, it's the cadence, and it's uh, fascinating. You know, I don't... I don't uh, I have a, some um, Southern writers that I think are more modern than than some of the older writers. Um, and you have one right there on your island, Tom McGuane. I mean, people don't think of him as a Southern writer, but because he writes so much about Montana. And, yeah. But uh, some of his stories, like his first book, 92 in the Shade, is about Key West. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are others like Nothing But Blue Skies and... Uh, oh. Uh, where the people travel from Montana into Florida and it's a bizarre sort of stories. And there, you know, there's some other ones that I, that I think all of you would love to read. I, I just finished this, um, Carl Hyacin. <laughs> oh yeah. Squeeze me. Oh. Carl Hyacin was born and raised in Miami and he's written at least a dozen books. Um, and his stuff just, it is so funny. You, you laugh every page. And the other guy that, that y'all should be reading too, that I love so much, and he writes so much about the area, is Randy Wayne White. Yeah. And he's got a new book out called Salt River that is mm. just fascinating. It's a Doc Ford book. And the, the last guy that, I, that probably nobody knows, his name is Harry Cruz. Harry Cruz was a... a a creative writing professor at the University of Florida, but led a bizarre life. Um, he he wrote a story about the Hell's Angels for Playboy magazine, a two part series where he became a Hell's Angel and traveled with him for months, and then wrote a story. When they found out about it, they beat the heck out of him, almost killed him. And he's written a lot of funny stuff, like Feast of Snakes. It's about a snake roundup in the wow. South. Yeah. It's crazy stuff. Ooh. So anyway, Harry Cruz. Go ahead. I'm sorry? Witty. Witty. Um, has I has a hand up. I love uh, Zora Neale Houston's work. Um, yeah. 
And, you know, I also love the current writer, Lauren Groff. Uh, if I'm pronounced, she's a short story writer. And, you know, she, her work isn't for everybody. Um, you know, there are interesting twists and turns and sort of a mysterious aura uh, in the locations where she that she writes about in, but they're all Florida. And uh, it's called, I think, Florida Stories or Florida. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's very contemporary. And, um, you know, I'd have to scratch my head a little bit. I know I, there are others I really like, but those two really stand out. Yeah, if I might, Pat, I'm a little plug for the Historical Society. Last year, we we created what really is an excellent book list. It's on the website, divided into fiction and nonfiction. And each of the books has a little description next to it. So you get a sense. And Randy Wayne uh, White, Hyacinth, Tim Dorsey, we've got the kind of uh, more contemporary and with Hyacinth and Dorsey, a little more uh, humorous madcap. Plus, um, uh, the older things as well. And again, it's divided between fiction and nonfiction and well worth looking at. It. It'll give you some really good ideas. Where is that list? On uh, the Historical Society website. Mm -hmm. And uh, next year we'll have your book on it. David will. David is going to be our speaker in January, and uh, we're going to let him talk a little bit more towards the end about that. Yeah. Uh, but there will be a. I, I, I hope I'm on the list next year. <laughs> <laughs> a little review. It might be with an asterisk. You never know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I appreciate y'all doing that too. It's so kind of you. I think it's a good way to launch this book, too. I do, too. Yay. 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 So if, if, if you're looking for um, some um, uh, Southern writers you haven't read for a while, I mean, go back and read Thomas Wolfe's Lacombe Ordain, oh. Oh, yes. yes. which is, is my all-time oh, favorite yeah. book. Oh, yeah. Uh, the sheer poetry of his prose is just beautiful. It, it just sort of... I don't know, it sends chills down my spine. But yeah. but a fun older writer that you probably haven't looked at for a while, Lillian Hillman. Oh, yes. Um, he's got some yeah. really racy, neat, mm -hmm. neat writing. I, I really like her. And um, Mary MFK Fisher. Mm -hmm. um, I believe she's also a Southern writer. Beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful work. Um, uh, Eudora Welty. Yeah. I you know, haven't looked at something <laughs> of, of that era for some time well worth reading i i, I so admire their their use of language in the older books that i think uh, this is personal opinion some of the modern writers uh forsake and i, and I think that's too bad because um you can make words sing yeah um, why do you and, think that is gay do you think it's because they think they're smarter than the rest of us I, I don't know that it's that. I, I think that we we our our world has has evolved into this uh, era of where we print instead of write. I mean, I think most of us would agree most writing is prettier than printing. Yeah. Where where we we contract words, you know, without the use of uh, vowels because that's easy to do when you're sending text messages or over the internet. Mm -hmm. I, the rapidity of our of our lives as they've evolved, I think, has um, uh, maybe caused a loss of some beauty in writing. Yeah, and and I think that's a sad thing. I mean, I think you're right. Uh, you, you go, go back, back and, and read the Old Testament; it's beautiful. I go mean, back and read, go, go back and read, go back and read some Dickens and oh, that's yeah. just things. The yes. Tale of Two Cities, for God's sake. Yes. He's not very southern, though. Good no, he's not. He's not. But, <laughs> what? But, but, yeah, southern man. England. <laughs> southern England. London. All right. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I just miss the beauty in writing. I know. I tell you, one of my favorites, Flannery O'Connor. Mm. 
and her short stories and her use of dialect writing, uh, her moral uh, conclusions at the end of her short stories. I, I don't know. She certainly gives me a kick. I, I like her writing very, very much. You know, and there's Truman Capote and Tennessee Williams. and But the Southern writing style has somewhat ended, I believe, probably. And I think Patrick was late in coming to it uh, in the 80s when he wrote this book. But I think for the most part, Southern writing and that whole genre ended probably in the 50s. Mm-hmm. So that's why we don't see those, uh, well. But why? Southern I mean, Gothic novels. When did it disappear? That, <laughs> Well, also, I think because we were becoming more of a melded nation and not so much North and South, and that we were coming together as uh, one nation, not so much the, the Old South. So I think, you know, writers write what's happening in the world today. I don't know, just a thought. Anyone on that? I like Ricky Bragg. He hasn't plagiarism problems, but uh, I think he's still a southern, young Southern writer. Not that mm-hmm. young. But... And Pat Conroy is always a great oh, guy. Oh, absolutely. That's, that's true. So there's well, that's a young, young Floridian. Well, she's probably 40 now. Um, she's out at the Iowa Writers' School, Karen Russell wrote Swamplandia when she was uh, 30. And it is just, so she grew up in Miami. It's a book about the Everglades. Um, and it is truly amazing. It's on isn't, the list. Absolutely isn't book, beautiful. Isn't that the book where she talks about uh, them driving across the Everglades making Alligator Alley? Uh, She may, yeah, she may a little bit, but this is a little more modern. It involves a uh, kind of a, uh, the development of a glitzier, larger Florida theme park next to her, her family's long, uh, more natural Florida theme park in the swamp. And a lot of time spent in the Everglades. And she's just a beautiful, beautiful writer. Karen Russell, Swamplandia. Yeah, it's got a lot of our reading yeah. list to the style. Yeah. Isn't that on our reading list? It is. It yeah. is. Pat, you, you asked a question earlier. You said it took you a long time to find out what summers meant. Yeah. And you said we, we'd have we'd put that up to everybody. Absolutely. It appears so many times in a land remember. I struggled with that. Hmm, wonder what it is. Anyone have a guess? S O M M E R S. It's in dialogue where he'll go, Summers, there's a place that uh, we ought to visit sometime. <laughs> it means somewhere. It yeah. means somewhere? somewhere. Yeah. I think so. Sure. Yeah. I think they so. still use that term in Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> I may not be pronouncing it quite right. So Someone with it, a southern accent needs to hop in here. No, it, it, you are pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> <laughs> huh? You know, you now, Liz, and, Liz and Tanny, you two have been quiet. Uh, things that you might like to uh, add here or. Um, Similar books from your home states. So happy to have you chime in. This has her hand up, I think. Yep. So we need to um, uh, unmute. Yeah, unmute. It looks like she can. No. No. Not yet. She Andy, actually, can you unmute? Liz may have signed in as a listener, so we okay. I may have caused a problem. <laughs> uh no. 
actually know. She's okay. a participant. This is Sean talking uh, in the control room here. Is that uh, Liz uh, that you're talking about? She is unmuted, so uh, it may be on her end. Just wanted to let you know. Okay. And Tanny can unmute her now. <laughs> Liz is going to stay quiet and sure. kill me next time I see And Dodie, what do you think? <laughs> Dodie? Unmute, Dodie. You're on mute, Dodie. This is going to get uh, there, I have unmuted. <laughs> hey. I'm, I mean, I loved this book, and I thought, um, my son, who lives in Jacksonville, actually recommended it to me several years ago. He moved to Florida and wanted to learn a little bit about the state he moved to. Uh, I think that as a northerner, there was so much I didn't know about Florida. I that it was, um, it was really exciting to read all about the cattle industry and and how the orange and the oranges and I, there was just. I don't think anybody in the north ever thinks about. I agree. Florida was. Um, it's certainly not taught in any kind of history. Florida, Florida, when you're from the north, is about sunshine and beaches and vacations. Um, it's like it didn't have a history other than, um, and that it wasn't part, uh, uh, part of the Civil War in a significant way. So I think that that was, you know, it was, I really enjoyed learning some of the history. Um, so that's pretty much my the characters are wonderful and Emma I had such sympathy I mean what a woman <laughs> it could do it yes. all <laughs> Dodie just unmuted so she may be ready oh can you hear me yeah, yeah. Huh? oh okay <laughs> No, I read the book several years ago, and I have searched every bookshelf in my house to find it so that I could reread it, and I haven't found it yet. But I love this book. I just thought it was fascinating learning about early Florida history. I agree with, with Tammy. Um, it, it was just, and the cattle drives, and the how difficult their life was mm. in the Everglades, mm. just incredible. You wonder how they survived. Mm -hmm. um, the the creatures, the mosquitoes, the terrible weather. The uh, um, it really it really was. It, think how hot it was for them in the summer, when we're so lucky we have air conditioning if we have to survive a Florida summer. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I didn't take part much because I couldn't remember the details <laughs> and the characters, but I've been really enjoyed this, this meeting. Well, I certainly hope that we'll all explore some of the places that are mentioned in this book that we haven't been to before, like 10,000 islands, maybe even surprise yourself with a trip to Miami. <laughs> Oh, I lived there for eight years. <laughs> but the bad, the bad guys live in the Ten Thousand Islands. I really, I loved the description of the guys who were. I guess they were rustlers, right? Oh Is my goodness! They, yeah, they were. Yeah. yeah. Um, again, the you know parallel with watching a John Wayne movie, <laughs> but pretty much, yeah. Yeah, that I that again that had and I've been coming to Florida since 1952, but like somebody else said, you're a kid. You go to the beach. You mm -hmm. go to the attractions. You, but unless you drive the central part of Florida, um, you don't realize 
that it's a whole different world yeah. than, really than the coast. Just a few hours away from where we are. Exactly. Gosh, if you've never been to Bach Tower in Lake Wales, you've missed oh, it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Fabulous yeah. garden, fabulous place. Yeah. My yeah. father used to say it's a place you go to gather your soul together. Mm -hmm. True. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got Lake Placid, the Palladium cap, the Caladium capital of the world. And, yeah, there you go. You know, I mean, there's just so much, and it is all so interesting. So we we once went to Crystal River for two mm -hmm. nights in a B and B. I think we had I had to write an art history lecture for the for the art alliance that I hadn't gotten around to finishing and I was in a panic and my husband had just been in one of the RPP plays and was exhausted. And we just went up there for two nights and we swam with the manatees oh. in Crystal river. And it was about the most beautiful lagoon I have ever seen spring fed uh, that you swam up a little river into you had to take a they give you a patio boat with snorkels and fins and you swim up a river into a spring-fed lagoon mm. that is crystal clear and you swim with the manatees they swim under you when you're swimming up this little river it's a little creek and then you're into this spring-fed lagoon that's surrounded with forest with moss on the bottom have any of you ever done that? I can highly recommend it. It is so much fun. Just, just beautiful and unique. Yeah, you can go up around there, Rainbow River nearby, and you can float down Rainbow oh, River. It's so yeah. clear. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, there's a lot to explore in our beautiful state. Hope we'll all do it, take advantage of that fact. It's kind of a nice time to do it because there aren't that many people here right now. And the weather's cool, so good time to explore. I think we're about ready to wrap up our question portion. And David, I want to, well, I think we've all met you now and you've played an important role in our book discussion, but you know, David will be speaking January 19th, I believe, at 2 o'clock with a Zoom presentation, and you'll be giving us a summary or an introduction to your book. Talk about it. Well, I've written this book about uh, Boca Grande, and I call it uh, The Official, Unofficial History of Boca Grande. And it has all of these stories that I've been collecting over a 40-year period uh, Many of them uh, were stories that I wrote for Pirate Coast Magazine mm. um, over, gosh, a 10 or 12 year period. And, and, and also stories that I wrote for the Boca Beacon or the Gasparilla Gazette many years ago. And also some new things, uh, um, interviews that I did with my grandfather, who was a rum smuggler who provided mm -hmm. Boca Grande uh, during Prohibition with most of its booze. He and one of his brothers. And uh, he tells me exactly how he did it. And then there are, of course, the, but I, I'm going to read the introduction to you uh, at, at the meeting. And then I'll probably uh, give you a short synopsis of, the pair, uh, of each chapter or some of the chapters anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, it's everything from my grandfather, the rum smuggler, to tarpon fishing, to the gas and to the crown and shields, and on and on. Well, we're looking forward to it, David. Yeah, me too. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Um, well, I think it's time to conclude. I want to thank you all for being an important part of our discussion today. Our sincere desire is to have you join us again. Thursday, January 14th, 4 to 5.30, to talk about River of Grass by Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Our first two books have been carefully chosen from the Society's book list, which can be found on our website. Your continued support and loyalty are really greatly appreciated. 
we ask you to renew your membership, continue to enjoy our programs via Zoom this season. And our calendar of events is posted on our website and included in your membership letter. Just register online or phone call to Kim Kyle at our office. Memberships can be purchased, of course, online or by calling. But we thank you all again. We wish you a happy holiday. And we'll see you in 2021. Thank you very much, Pat. Yeah. Keep reading about Florida. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's great stuff.